All right, welcome back everyone to JFace Games. Let's get right into talking about Vagabond. This is a new tabletop RPG. It's currently on Kickstarter. It had a preview, so let's get into it. First, I'd say that what immediately sets this game apart from other games is that it has a solo mode. I would say this is a tactical game in nature. And with that, they've built in this solo play mode for combat and technically also for uh, RP scenarios. Uh, so I guess that it's sort of akin to something like Gloomhaven that you're going to be able to solo an RPG, which I think is a pretty cool concept. I haven't tested that out yet, but I like that it's built in. So what is the resolution system for this game? Uh, it's a D20 rollover game. So that means you're going to be rolling your D20 and you are trying to roll higher than or equal to the target number or threshold. But it has an interesting distinction based on what you're actually trying to do. In a given situation, you might be trying to either um, attack, defend, or perform a skill. And they refer to these as accuracy tests, defensive tests, or skill tests. In this game, the GM, or the Arbiter, is not going to roll any dice. This seems to be sort of a trend in a lot of games lately. It's actually what I'm trying to do. I think it puts a lot more on the players and keeps them a little bit more engaged, personally. Uh, so, anyways, if I'm trying to attack a monster, this is an accuracy test. And I'm going to be rolling a d20 plus my weapon aptitude and then plus my attribute stat bonus. So I'm trying to get higher with that total, higher than the monster's AC, which is the, like a, a, which is base 12 plus the monster's dodge skill. Um, on the monster stat sheet, this is listed as their AT, which I think was a little confusing at first, but overall I think that it was pretty easy to grasp, right? So in other words, I'm rolling this stat, rolling a d20 plus whatever my attribute is bonus plus um, my uh, aptitude, perfect. If I'm trying to defend, it's the same thing, right? It's the monster has an attack that's coming. It'll specify what defense you have to roll against. You're then going to use one of three defenses. There are three defenses. There's a dodge, an endure, and a resolve, right? You're going to have a modifier based on all three of those. You are then going to roll a d20 plus your dodge, endure, or resolve, depending on the attack you're trying to deal with. And you're trying to roll equal to or over. If you've got a shield, maybe you get a plus one or plus two. If you're wearing armor, armor is going to reduce damage, uh, not add to your defensive roll. I believe that the damage reduction is a die, so you're gonna either roll a d4 or a d up to a d8, depending on the type of armor. And whatever you roll is gonna reduce the amount. So it's a little bit more variable, it's not predictable. That's kind of cool, right? Before we talk about skill tests, let's really talk about aptitudes. So what really is neat is that there is an aptitude for everything. If you look here, this is looking at aptitude ranks. It's either trained, proficient, adept. It goes one to six. And everything has an aptitude. You have an aptitude for armor. You have an aptitude for weapons. You have an aptitude for the different skills. Um, when it comes to weapons, you have an aptitude for either weapon groups or weapon types, right? So there's, a, there's an aptitude for, you have weapon, aptitude for tools. So a skill is in essence a non-combat thing you're doing and your aptitude uh, is going to determine your skills pluses and minuses you're getting. So each skill is also associated with a certain attribute and there are six attributes or maybe seven. We'll talk about those in just a moment when we get into classes. Uh, so this is all coming into play, right? So if I'm doing a skill test, this is really kind of cool to me, I think, because your skill is a calculation, right? That you have to do initially. Uh, but once you've calculated it, once you've gotten that number, it's, you know, laid out for you very easy. The calculation is going to be skill capacity, which equals your attribute modifier plus your skill bonus or your aptitude level. Then you determine your skill difficulty, which is D20 minus your skill capacity, right? So in other words, it's the DC is going to be 20 minus your attribute modifier minus your aptitude level in that skill. And this gives you your skill difficulty, right? And this is a number that you are trying to roll over when you're performing this skill check. So what's really nice is the GM never has to come up with a DC on the fly or for anything in particular you're trying to do. Um, you have the character sheets and it's it has a formula to it. And then all these things are just calculated very quickly for you. Uh, and that's really nice. So I'll show you the character sheet real quick. This is a character, this is just a fillable character sheet. So if I have a 15 strength, 
Here it is, gives me a plus two modifier. And so here's athleticism and say I am trained in it or say that I have, I forget the levels, but say I have three ranks in it, three aptitude ranks in athleticism. Now you can see that I have a 15, right? And if this were a 17 strength, then you could see that I have a 14. So I have to roll a 14 or higher in order to succeed at my athleticism check. Now, what this doesn't do, obviously, is it doesn't do things like scale for difficulty, right? It's not like, oh, this is an easy challenge versus a hard challenge. But I think this base number is the idea that you are doing something under pressure and in dangerous scenarios. So you need to know sort of when as a GM you're asking for a role versus just letting someone do something, right? So that covers sort of basic resolution. Right? We have these basic resolution for accuracy or attacking, defending yourself, or any sort of skill. Before we get into um, characters and, and how characters are designed, let's talk about how you can actually modify these roles. Right? So a 14 is hard to, to get, technically, right? and a 17 strength is pretty good. So you're either going to have something like favored and hindered, which is in essence advantage or disadvantage. You're going to roll two dice and take the higher or the lower. That's one way you could modify. Another way you could modify is with something called luck. Luck is built into the characters, right? So every class is going to have a different die that's associated with that class that's a luck score, right? So usually this is like a D2. And what happens is anytime you take a long rest, you're gonna roll that D2 and you're gonna see how many luck points you have until you need to take another long rest. What can you do with luck? Luck is is interesting because luck is I, I, either luck is going to give you favored, meaning you're going to have advantage. You take the higher of two rolls, or it allows you to re-roll if you've rolled poorly. You can then re-roll, or you can immediately get maximum damage on an attack. Which I love that third one. I think that's awesome, right? So luck is very useful, right? You can use this luck for multiple things, right? So that's another way you can modify. Other dice modifications that I thought were interesting is critical rolls. Critical rolls, if you get a 20 on a d20, naturally, then depending on what you were trying to do depends on what the benefit is. If you were trying to do an accuracy test or an attack, you get double damage. If you were trying to do a defensive test or defensive roll, you take no damage and you immediately get to make a counterattack. And if you're doing a skill test and you get a natural 20, you gain another luck point, which is awesome. What I thought was interesting to think about, though, is if you got a critical defense against a ranged attack, I wonder if you can retaliate immediately, even though they're far away and you're a melee guy. I hope that you could. I hope that there's something, you know, I know this game's really tactical, but it'd be really cool if you could retaliate at range with some sort of badass sort of thematic response. Anyways. Another modification is there, it's not a modification technically, but apparently there is exploding dice that exist in this game also. Uh, exploding dice being that if you roll the highest number, you get to continue to re-roll that die, but I didn't see anything pop out. I'm sure that it's a little bit more in the features and powers, and it didn't come out in sort of like the base game mechanics. All right, so let's get into actual character design now. Now, attributes in this game, um, you have a little bit different than say 5e Dungeons and Dragons. You have strength, dexterity, vitality, awareness, logic, and presence, okay? Now, key things to note about these are they are linked to skills in the game. So uh, whenever you have a skill test, these are gonna come into play, except for vitality. It's not linked to any skills. And there are other effects. So strength is gonna be your, if you're making melee attacks, you're gonna be adding your strength bonus to the attacks. Uh, dexterity is actually going to determine uh, your speed. It's going to determine how far you can move on a turn in terms of squares. Uh, vitality is going to determine your health. Uh, awareness is actually your ranged attacks, which is really cool. That's unlinked from dexterity, like in 5e. Logic is your knowledge. Presence is your social skills. In addition to this, depending on the type of class you are, if you're a caster, for instance, your logic, awareness, or presence might end up being your mana pool, depending on what type of caster you all are. And mana pools are important for casting spells, and we'll get into that when we get into sort of the magic system. Also, what's important to note is different things like dexterity, I believe dexterity, vitality, and awareness are linked to the different defenses, right? Um, I believe those are the three, Ooh, so bear with me. Now, there are a few different ways to determine these attributes. First off, you can do the, the point by, uh, they have uh, a normal point by system here. They have standard arrays here. 
And then they also have a random standard arrays test uh, uh, table. So you could have a, a little bit different sort of things, right? After that, you're then gonna choose your lineage. Now your lineage is sort of um, what other games might call your kin or your ancestry uh, or your race, depending on how old school the game is. And these lineages are, there's a lot. So here you can see a list of the lineages. I think that when I read through this, there's a smorgasbord. When I read through this, I counted about 36 total um, lineages, both main lineage and then sub lineages, right? Your lineage is gonna end up determining your, um, the size of your creature, uh, bonuses to things like skills, aptitudes, attributes. It's gonna give you a potential new ability. And there's a lot of fun things in here. I liked this bovine. You see here's a bovine, which is a sub, sub lineage of the beast folk. And the bovine is able to carry more load, uh, which is very fitting. And they were able to sort of do a rush action as a quick action. Uh, we'll talk about those later in terms of action economy. Uh, they also have a mimic in here. So you can be a mimic. Uh, you can be a mimic in here and that's a lineage you can play and that's sort of on the cover of the Kickstarter also. Uh, I like the little things that are done in here. So if you've played fifth edition, like little things like for instance, the elves, they don't have dark vision in this game. Instead, they just don't become blind if they're in darkness, right? I think that cleans up a lot of the things, you know, there's all these discussions and debates that happen with things like dark vision where it gets a little confusing and I think that cleans it up. So there's a lot of little things that clean things up. I also really liked the vermin. There was a vermin uh, beast form, uh, beast folk. And this sort of reminded me of Usagi Yojimbo. So I thought that was really fun. Um, all right, after this, you choose your past which is sort of akin to backgrounds, but I really liked this terminology because they use two different terms. They use past and they have future, right? Past is sort of your background and where you came from. Future is very much tied towards the leveling or advancement mechanics in the game. I think these terms are just very evocative, right? These terms are really cool. So what's gonna happen with your past? Your past is gonna give you things like uh, two skills or aptitudes for skills. It might have an aptitude towards some form of a tool. It might have some starting equipment, some starting wealth, and then you're also going to have some sort of uh, power potentially. And that power is usually going to give you some sort of aptitude um, in like armor, or it gives you specific defenses or specific skill tests, like bonuses to specific skill tests or defenses, right? So really interesting things. You then get to choose from one of the classes, and there are 16 in this game. You can see here the list of these 16 classes and, and there's some really fun sounding ones. You have a dancer, an exemplar, a pugilist, a vanguard. And I haven't seen some of these as base classes in other systems. So what is a class gonna do for you? Well, the class is in essence gonna give you your hit points, your hit dice, and tell you what your starting luck die is. Uh, you're also gonna get your starting aptitudes for different weapons, armor, defenses, skills, and tools. Every class has this nice little chart that shows 10 levels in the game and every level you're going to be getting some sort of feature that adds to your class. At second level you get to choose one of two, at least it's two here, there might be more as the Kickstarter goes, one of two different uh, subclasses. And these subclasses are going to give you more flavor to sort of play with. Some of the classes, but not all yet, have this little section here which is really nice which kind of gives you the, one, it gives you the playing style overall, but then it talks about what sort of actions you are probably going to be taking, like suggestions for your main action, your quick action, and sort of where in combat you might want to be. And I thought this was really nice, not just to hear a narrative description of what the class might do, but having some mechanics tied to it to give you an idea of how that might actually look in play. So I thought that was a really nice touch. Leveling seems really generous also. Every level you are going to get to increase one of your attributes. You're gonna increase one aptitude, whether it's weapon, armor, skill, or tool. And you get to increase a rank in defense of your choice, dodge, endurance, or resolve. Uh, the book then talks about different types of leveling triggers, whether you wanna do sort of milestone or group you know, leveling, or if you wanna do some sort of individual leveling. Uh, it then goes into a bit on futures. So futures, there are different types of archetypes. You can see two here, the business mogul and the chosen one. And each archetype then has a fate and a destiny. Uh, fates are new powers you might get from that archetype. And destinies are sort of suggested paths or accomplishments that your character should be sort of striving towards. Each time you get two destinies done, you gain another talent. 
And this seems to be a nice mechanical sort of tie-in to sort of motivate the character or the player to RP and sort of develop their character. Uh, talents seem to be the equivalent of feats in 5th edition. They kind of break or change rules a little bit. Uh, and you might also get these depending on your class. Not every class gets these, but some class gets these at different levels and you get a new talent, right? So the fighter gets talents. The last thing for characters is equipment and load. You have a load score. That score is equal to your strength. Every item in the game has a load associated with it and you can't go over your strength or you become encumbered. So there's a paragraph here talking about different types of loads. You can see negligible down here in the bottom right. Up here you can see this sort of light load, heavy load, burdensome. And so it gives you an idea for the GM to kind of add live on the fly something the player is trying to pick up. They pick up something burdensome, that's 10 load. If they've only got a 12 strength, well, depending on what else they're carrying, they might not be able to carry that item, right? It's too much. So when it comes to combat, let's break it down into the terms we kind of know, right? Initiative, initiative symbol. You are going to make a coin toss, right? You're gonna roll a D2 or a coin flip and whichever side wins, that side goes first and you have in essence like a group turn. Otherwise, if you don't win, the enemies go first and they have their group turn. If a side is just surprised, that means they're gonna go second, their group turn is second, and they don't have access to their quick actions, which when we get into actions, you'll realize that's a pretty big deal, right? Turns and rounds are as sort of normal. They seem pretty straightforward. When it's your side's group turn, you choose your order, whoever wants to go. Once both sides have taken their turns, you have completed a round. The game also adds in progress clocks. Uh, I think I first saw progress clocks in Forge in the Dark, and so I, I love progress clocks. These are narrative clocks that let you know how time is passing, mainly in reference to something happening potentially bad or dramatic, right? These will progress if you ever fail a skill check or if you take a short rest at any point in time. So you want to limit your short rest because the progress will be ticking away. The the cave is going to cave in or, or the, the tunnel is going to cave in or something like that, right? There's also a quick comment here about the end of combat, uh, that it's either going to be some form of death, surrender, or fleeing. I think that this really ties in to flushing out everything with some form of terminology and mechanic, because if you plan to play solo, it's going to have, um, there's gotta be some sort of engine of sorts that you're gonna be able to run off of. And so having all these little keywords uh, becomes very important so that you never have that kind of confusion, right? But it ends up being a lot of keywords, but you could have a very simple reference table, right? There are three main actions you're gonna be using to take on your turn. You can have a main action, a quick action, and a move. Your main actions are gonna be things like attacking, casting a spell, defending yourself, helping someone else, uh, holding your turn, rushing, um, or using something, right? Quick actions are gonna be things like counter, focus, quick cast, reload, speak, and withdraw. Now the ones I think that are important to point out are rush, this is a double movement, um, so it's kind of like dash. Counter is in essence an opportunity attack, which I think is really interesting because you have to use a quick action to then be able to perform an opportunity attack, which is you get to attack someone if they move away from you. Now, I don't know if that means you only get one of them. I assume you'd only get one of these, but that's really nice. Focus is in essence sort of your ability to concentrate and continue to cast a spell from round to round. So you cast a spell in the next turn. If you wanna keep that spell going, you've gotta succeed at a focus skill check. Or I mean, sorry, you have to take a focus action. Uh, withdrawal is a way to become immune to counters while you're moving. So if you take a withdrawal quick action, now people can't attack you with a counter quick action. And I think uh, quick cast we'll talk about later on when we get into magic. Quick casting is a factor of casting a spell faster. I think the quick actions in this game are the real sort of meat of the tactics. Uh, you can really do a lot with these and manipulate how your character plays. Also, the classes really lean into these as well. Like the fighter, for instance, has an ability called Harry, which is you use your quick action as a second attack on your turn. Okay, so the fighter now has two attacks. But they also have an ability that if the fighter is ever favored, meaning that they have advantage on an attack they can perform, instead of getting advantage on one attack, they can take two attacks with just two regular attacks. So now, if you have a fighter who has 
a favored opportunity against an enemy, and they have the ability Harry, they could end up dishing out three attacks, right? So it's really fun. I like that sort of building and how you have a class that you can kind of uh, really see things start to flush out. Moving is actually really cool. So, so in essence, you get to take your move at any point during the group's turn. So this means that if you and I want to go flank someone, right, because we're both going to get a bonus for attacking that monster for flanking them, then we want to both be able to move and both be able to attack, right? In other games where your turn is linked to your movement and attack, you have to move and then you have to do your attack without a bonus and then your buddy moves and then they get to take an attack with a bonus. In this game, movements and actions all occur sometime in the group turn. So you and I can both move, both flank, and then you can attack and then I can attack. So that's really nice, right? Hope, I don't know how that plays in, in games play, but I would not think that that adds to any time. And I think it adds a lot more tactics. So I think that's really neat. Another thing which I didn't understand fully is that if you take a rush quick action, you can technically take your move on the opposing forces turn. And I don't know what this looks like. I don't know if that ends up being like kiting, like you're kiting the uh, bad guys around. Um, so I'd be very interested in what that, I could see, for instance, a um, caster taking the rush as a quick action uh, in order to, or some sort of backline character taking the rush action as a quick action and then waiting until the bad guys turn and they move towards them and then they actually take their movement. So that would be really neat. Now there are a lot of conditions and statuses in the game and sort of one-offs in the game like flanking and weaknesses, immunities, resistances. I think there's eight conditions and I think there's 22 statuses. I think a lot of these are really thematic and cool and you expect things like this in sort of a highly tactical, realistic game. My only suggestion would be to do something like, for instance, the card game Keyforge, where anytime a monster, or so in Keyforge, if you have a card and it has a keyword on it, it always explains what that keyword is. So in this game, you could have, anytime you have a monster stat block, you and it, the stat block has an effect that adds a status of some sort, you could have what that status is in the stat block. Because the nice thing is that in this game, a lot of the monster stat blocks are really lean and condensed. So it would be a, a very low hanging fruit to add like, oh, this monster staggers with this attack. Here's what stagger does again, real quick. Boom, like a little bullet point. My, my thoughts. That's what I would probably end up doing anyways in my DM notes. Of the conditions uh, that are here, I would really like, I'm really happy to see bloodied. You know, I always thought it was a great sort of condition in fourth edition D&D. What bloodied is, is just really a, con it's really just a trigger. You know, it's letting you know that when you are at half health, you are now bloodied. And then you can tie all sorts of attacks and actions and features and powers to that bloodied number, like that condition when you are bloodied. Really fun. Uh, you might have a spot in the character sheet for bloodied numbers so that people don't have to calculate it on the fly or they write it down somewhere in the margin, just as another like potential. What else about combat? They talk about zones in combat. And what's interesting about these zones is they're just thematic in nature, right? They talk about zones, but they describe it as frontline, midline, and backline. And these are almost more, what do you want to be doing as a fighter? Frontline being in the mix with the monsters going toe to toe, backline being as far away as possible, not really getting up close, and midline being almost like a skirmisher who wants to get in and out on their turn. They, they use their withdrawal action a lot because they're trying not to get um, counters, counter attacks on them. And I like these concepts. They, they, they tie these concepts also into the monsters. They do a little teach in the GM section and they tell you each monsters sort of what they want to be doing. And I think that this would really help out new GMs to get the concepts of tactics. Oh, this is a midline monster. Oh, immediately you realize I want to be in and out and skirmishing, right? So finally, we have health and damage, okay? Health is based on hit points. Hit points are gonna be based on your character class and your vitality. Um, if you ever get down to zero hit points, you now have a condition called staggered. This means you fall down prone, you're incapacitated, boom. There's this really slick dying effect now though. At the beginning of each group turn, you have to take one of your hit dice. So if you're fourth level, you've got four hit dice. You're gonna take one of your hit dice and you're gonna roll it. If you get a one, you're immediately dead. If you, do, if you do this enough, you're gonna run out of hit dice at that point in time. You're also immediately dead. So if you're fourth level and you haven't taken a rest, then you have all four hit dice. That means you've got four rounds, hopefully, that you don't roll a one. What's really fascinating is that if you think about it, a barbarian has a D10 hit dice, 
So 10% chance of dying on those rolls. A wizard has a d4 hit dice. 25% chance of dying. So that means you must keep those squishy casters up or they are going to die faster, right? The other thing is that this staggered effect is also something that bosses can get. Uh, the, the enemy bosses or heroes, I think they refer to them as, also can get the staggered effect when they hit to zero hit points. Other monsters just immediately die. When it comes to resting, you are going to take either a long rest and you're gonna get all of your health back and you're gonna get to reroll your luck die to see how much luck you have. And this takes like eight hours, I think, the typical sort of time frame. Or you're gonna take a short rest. And in a short rest, it's gonna be 10 minutes and you're gonna be able to roll only one hit dice to get your health back, which also means that if you ever go down to zero, you have less hit dice to roll. Um, but you do get to add your vitality modifier to that hit dice, which is nice. But remember, short rest has also progressed the clocks. So there's this risk reward going on there as well. But let's get into magic, because the other thing you get when you take a long rest is you get all your mana back. But what is mana? Okay, magic time. I really like the magic system. It took me a second to kind of read and get a grasp on things, but I think it's fun. I think that it's really interesting. So it actually reminds me a lot of the open legend system a little bit in terms of their powers for banes and boons. So you have mana. And your mana number, how much mana you have, is going to be your primary casting attribute plus two times your level. So if I'm a wizard with 16 logic and I'm second level, I've got 20 mana. 16 plus two times two is four. I would then also use logic to cast my spells. But there's a fun twist here in terms of casting. If I'm doing a direct attack on a monster, right? So I'm shooting that that guy right there. I'm, I'm hitting them then what I'm doing is I'm rolling an accuracy test, right? I roll a d20 plus aptitude in that magic type or essence plus my attribute modifier for logic, right? However, if I am trying to uh, indirectly target someone, which I assume is kind of like if I do a fireball and it's hitting this area, then what you're doing is you're doing something more akin to a skill test. I would do a d20 where my target number ends up being, I'd roll a d20 where my against 20 minus my logic modifier minus my aptitude and that magic type. And I think this is kind of fun. I think it's a nice little twist on things, right? How it's not just the enemy saving or me rolling the same thing every time. Then what happens? Well, then you have the magic spells themselves. And this reminds me of the game Open Legend, like I mentioned. You have a freedom to sort of design and change spells on the fly. So you have different essence types for magic. Uh, I'll show a little bit of that right down here. So here are some of those essence. Uh, barrier, beast, bless. And this is what I mean by banes and, and boons from Open Legend, right? So you have burn, for instance, here, okay? Burn is like a fire damage and you're gonna target something, right? Now, the base damage for a lot of these is 1d6. So you're going to have this 1d6 damage you're about to do to someone. And then maybe after the fact, after you cast it, you focus your next turn and you do a quick action focus to keep that effect going. And this would normally mean that, okay, I take my main action, I cast burn. I then I'm gonna be doing a d6 to that person. My next turn, I'm doing a quick action to maintain it, etc. That would take no mana, but you could use one mana to add another d6 damage. I could do two mana to add two d6. I believe you can do as many as you want, right? I have 16 d6, I don't know if you can do that. There might be a cap, but maybe I could. Maybe I could just burn a ton, right? Oh no, I'm sorry, here's a nice little chart. This, I'm glad I'm on this page. The maximum mana that I can spend on a spell is dependent on my aptitude rank in it, right? So if I'm just proficient, I could only do four, but that means if I'm proficient in burn, I could do 5d6 to someone, right? Now, you can also modify the spell itself. Here's another chart down here. This looks at if I decide to make, turn it into a cone, turn it into an aura, turn it into a line, turn it into a sphere. It doesn't cost anything, for instance, if I'm just doing the bolt action, right? Bolt action has no additional mana cost, but if I want to do one of these other area effects, I could now add mana to it. I could also come down here, I could also decide to quick cast it, meaning that I don't cast burn as a main action. Right? So my main action, I might be defending myself because I'm surrounded by things. So I'm defending myself and then I use my quick action to quick action an aura of fire around me to hurt the people that are attacking me, but I'm still blocking better, right? So this might be, for instance, two mana, 
to make this action a 3d6 total damage. I might do another four mana to make this a 30 foot cone, right? So now if I cast this as my main action, this would cost me a total of six mana, which means that I would have to at least be adept in this burn ability. If I wanted to do a quick action, that's when it gets a little hefty, right? Turning something into a quick action doubles the mana cost. So that would mean that I'd have to spend 12 mana and that means I'd have to be an expert in that ability. But hey, you have this total, you have this choice now where you can choose how you want to do this. And you don't get the mana back until you take a long action, long rest, so that's a problem. Now, this was a quick overview of what's going on. Uh, there's probably a lot more in this game. The GM section in the playtest, for instance, uh, it's still getting flushed out is what it looks like. There's some good notes in there, but it talks about things like exploration. Uh, it goes into more practice of those dungeon clocks, um, encounter design, etc. It sounds like the Kickstarter has a lot of big plans. And I think that they would come through with those big plans based on what I'm seeing here in terms of this design. I hope this gives you a nice idea of what this game is shaping up to be. Um, I'll do an encounter video next to run through it and show you what it's like, but I think I'm going to probably back it up uh, probably in just a minute. Uh, so hit the bell, hit the subscribe, and um, I'll paste a link in the actual uh, bottom section.